Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March edition of the Aging Information Subcommittee of the NCRO webinar. The title of our presentation this morning is The Problem with Pain. Uh, Andy Chaps Chapman is our speaker. She's a reg registered nurse, a certified dementia practitioner, a certified Alzheimer's dementia care trainer, an emergency, emergency palliative end-of-life care trainer, a certified Montessori dementia care professional, and a certified dementia support group facilitator. All of those were that alphabet soup following her name in her uh, biography. Uh, she has an extensive background in hospice care, and she works with Wayne State University as a writer and presenter. She's a consultant slash presenter with Select Med. Uh, they do seminars and consulting. Uh, as I said, that she has her credentials with uh, also with the National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners, and she serves on the Education Board for Michigan Home Health and Hospice, Hospice Association, and recently became a volunteer for Elder, Elder Abuse Alliance in Genesee County. Uh, so without further ado, let me give you Andy, and we'll uh, we'll get started. Let me know if you. Take it away. Okay, wonderful. Um, when I'm talking about this, I, I just want you to know that I don't mean to be contrary, uh, but I have to say that I disagree a little bit with St. Augustine's comment here that the greatest evil is physical pain. I think that it's not the physical pain that causes the greatest problem, it's the biases that go along with pain. And it's assuming that somebody doesn't feel what they feel. There's that being judged. And so it is living with the, uh, the determination that maybe something isn't real to this individual. So that can be chronic pain, it can be phantom pain, it can be lots of different things. But to the degree that we have biases when it comes to somebody talking about their pain, we actually diminish empathy. And so that's one of the things that I wanna get right out of the chute here is that we wanna make sure that we are always listening to an individual. Now, um, I'm not gonna belabor all of these objectives, but I do wanna say that we're gonna talk about a lot of different things, including tolerance and addiction, um, even pseudo addiction. You may not even know what that is, but we're gonna discuss that because there's really a myriad of things that make assessing pain and discussing pain very complex, very, very challenging for people because it's really, it's a sensory reactive phenomenon that we deal with. And it doesn't just impact us as persons who are assessing the pain, it is impacting those that have the pain as well. So. Those are some of the things. But what does pain look like in 2021? Um, when you think about what's going on in the United States and the people that are living with pain, we have the most common diseases that we think of with cardiac and respiratory and that kind of thing. But about 20% of every adult over 65 years of age are going to be in this population that's going to have chronic pain. And the difference between chronic pain and acute pain is this. Acute pain means that you have stubbed your toe, you've slapped your arm on something and hurt yourself, you've broken a leg. That's an acute pain, that's a right now. But chronic pain is after the injury has perhaps healed, but it goes on longer, like greater than three months. And for some people, if they've broken a bone, they have arthritis that sets in. And so this is going to be that chronic pain. And they actually looked at a study of people that were in um, nursing facilities and said that approximately 80% of those that are in nursing facilities actually have a chronic pain situation going on. And yet sometimes with dementia, they can't even tell you what's going on or if they have some sensory deprivation. 
they aren't going to be able to tell you what's happening. Women are most likely going to experience chronic pain. Um, we live longer, but we live longer in pain. And so it's really not a win. Um, and then we have, of course, COVID. How that impacted pain management was this, that we had a lot of facilities that just took care of pain and they wound up closing their doors because they didn't want anybody in, they were worried about the disease, et cetera. And so a lot of these people actually did go to street drugs. There were several people that um, I have worked with here in the area that went to street drugs because it was easier to get, which is just horrible. So we kind of let these people down a little bit, I think. And pain does change people. If you think about how you feel when you're having pain, you may not want people around you, but it does definitely change you. And I thought that this meme was actually kind of interesting because it lets you know you're still alive. Nobody wants to live that way. We really don't. So when we think about what pain can control in our lives and how it changes us, we have to think about what we eat. We are a nation that goes for comfort food. If we have emotional pain, we're going to eat. If we have physical pain, sometimes we're going to eat or we're not going to eat. And that's where the weight loss or weight gain can come in. So it's a, a physical pain and a psychological pain that goes along with that. And let's throw in a little bit of spiritual pain on top of that because we couldn't go to churches. And so that was a big issue for people how we do our job or whether or not we're able to keep that job. In nursing, there's a tremendous amount of lifting. And I think about all of our home health aides and the amount of lifting and uh, work that they do with bending. If they have a low back problem, and that's more of a chronic situation, it's like the gift that keeps on giving, they may not be able to keep their job because they can't effectively lift that person. They're gonna hurt themselves or the person that they're trying to lift. Maintaining friendships is another area. If you think about somebody who is uh, the, the proverbial Debbie Downer, uh, if your name's Debbie, I'm sorry, um, but uh, if you think about this individual, they're the one that's constantly complaining. Um, and I, a little side note here, it was really actually kind of amusing because there were three very elderly ladies sitting in a little group and they were chatting and they were talking about the pain that they were having. And it was almost like they had to outdo one another. Well, you should know how my back feels or my leg feels. And it was just amusing to listen to them. But if we have somebody that's complaining all the time and we can't relate to that, we're going to avoid them. And so it really impacts friendships and socialization. And that's where it goes into how we view others and how we view ourselves. Um, my pain is going to be different from your pain. And I have had to learn how to maintain uh, myself because I can't take a lot of medications. And so I could easily look at somebody and say, well, you know, I don't have to take anything for that. I can't believe that they're grumping about it. Don't ever compare somebody else's pain with yours because you just don't know. And this is where it becomes the yin and the yang, especially in medicine. Um, I watched a doctor walk out of a lady's room one day and he was so genuine in his response, but she was a beautiful woman and he walked out and he said, um, you know, I, I can't believe she's in so much pain. She's so pretty. And I said, wow, you know, you just didn't say that. Excuse me. I'm checking my phone because hopefully if I go out on the internet, somebody is going to be able to let me know. Okay. So it's not you guys. Thank you. I'm glad. But this is why we have to remember that we can certainly be the reason that somebody suffers a little bit more or we can be that person that's going to help them through it. This is our responsibility just as another human being in life. But when we allow biases to take over judgment, then we are ineffective. We know what pain is produced by. 
if I came over there and poked you in the eye right now, it's gonna hurt. But we also have diseases that cause a lot of pain. Some of those are chronic diseases. And I mentioned that we have problems with arthritis and uh, some of our diseases like cancer are going to produce pain. But if you think about what happened, especially during COVID in this last two years, we had more loneliness, despair, and depression. And when people are lonely, despair, or depressed, they're going to complain more because what they have to focus on is themselves. And a, a little story, it's an actual true story, a friend of, or not a friend, if she was one of the patients, she became a friend, but she called and told me that her pain was eight out of 10. Now that's a pretty high number when somebody is reporting their pain that high. And I went over to see her and uh, it was obvious that she was definitely having pain. But in my discussion with her, I, she was able to tell me in about five minutes time that she was um, missing her grandchildren terribly. She hadn't seen them in over three weeks. Her daughter who lived next door came over and put something in the microwave for her to eat and then left and didn't have time to visit. And it was a beautiful sunny day and she couldn't even get outside. So it was when I was listening to her and thinking, okay, she's got physical pain, no doubt, but the emotional pain was making the physical pain worse. So I know that you don't know me, but you'll find out if you do get to know me that I am a very unusual practitioner. Um, I believe that when you were taking care of somebody, you look at their environment. And if they have someone else living with them, you want to pay attention to them. But if they have a fur baby, you want to pay attention to the fur baby. Now, she happened to have a cat. And so uh, being a rather unusual practitioner, as I said, um, I carried pig ears, dog bone, catnip, and laser pen in my nursing bag. And the reason I did that was to help make the fur baby happier too, because that was a real strong connection, uh, emotional connection for the patient. So we got her cat um, pretty messed up with catnip. And I showed her how to use the laser pen and she had that cat going everywhere. It was just hilarious. But here was the biggest transformation. That transformation was that instead of being all crumbled up while she was in pain, she was sitting right straight up and laughing, watching that cat. So I knew I was on the right track. Why wouldn't I just go in there and start pumping her full of medication? Because it's going to make her a very high fall risk. And I didn't want that to happen. And so, you know, you had take care of the mind. The mind is the greatest organ we have because it actually can control the rest of us. But during this time when we were cut off with everybody, we not only saw increases in pain and increases in death, but we also saw an increase in the decline, mental decline in many of our people. So those three aspects are very important. Please don't ever, ever just disregard those. It is definitely one of those things we want to pay attention to. And I think sometimes at least 75% of our pain responses can come through the emotional responses. But again, you have to take your time. We also have to do a lot of training. And I think that this is where we have some bigger problems because we'll hear somebody say, well, I can take care of that pain. You know, you're gonna have the surgery, we're gonna fix your leg, we're gonna do whatever, and you're gonna be just fine. Achieving 100% pain-free in some individuals is ludicrous. And we need to remember that life, if you're alive, you're going to feel pain sometimes. It's how we deal with that pain and how we treat that pain that is going to be very important in the realism of the fact that some people are not going to be pain-free, but we can make them more comfortable. That is an important key. When people come from a different culture, we misunderstand them, and sometimes they misunderstand us. But in some cultures, for example, you may have someone who um, 
is very emotional when they have something going on and might be a little bit more loud or verbose when they're having pain, as opposed to some cultures that are very stoic and very quiet when they're having pain. So if we look at that person, we might completely miss what's going on or overreact to what's going on. Gender, I already talked about a little bit, but this one's very interesting because we can see um, where women are going to complain a little bit more, but I believe that women are geared to do that. You know, we have raised our young men that big boys don't cry and walk it off, but that's not realistic sometimes. But gender can definitely um, impact that. And then, of course, whether or not somebody is really pretty, the more attractive someone is actually the less pain medication they get which should never be the case it should be based on that person and what's going on and not just assumed and that's again where biases come in but everybody knows that beautiful people are happier and sexier and healthier right not necessarily true age we have more unhealthy young people in our society today they are not active. They don't go out there and get the mud and grime on them that persons in my age group did. We didn't come in until the lights came on on the street lights. If you were lucky enough to live in an area where there are street lights, but the point is that you know our young people sit around today and they have a lot of screen time and they 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 do things that aren't necessarily healthy for their body. Foods that they're eating are not necessarily healthy. But when we look at a young person who's experiencing pain and an older person experiencing pain, we tend to judge that the older person hanging on to the rail as they're walking, well, that's understandable. But what about a 21 year old? Or for that matter, a 12 year old? My grandson had leukemia and he would go out and he would play hard because he didn't want to be thought of different. And so that was an issue for him. And then he would pay for it hugely. But this is where we have misunderstanding with age. Mental status, um, kind of environment, traumatic brain injury, even if it's mild, they may not be able to tell us what's going on. Persons with Down syndrome oftentimes have bones that will slip in and out of joint. They have a lot of digestive problems. And depending on the severity of their impairment they may not be able to tell us but they'll certainly show us and that would be you know they'll make push us away or be disagreeable when we're trying to do something and instead of assuming that there's pain they assume that this is a behavioral thing so they're giving them a whole different line of medication that doesn't really help them our our response should always be to look at this person as an individual, but understand their disease process as well. And again, societal acceptance, that goes back to culture. But what was appropriate in their culture might not be something that we look at in this culture. And so I, I don't wanna belabor any of these points, but it definitely is very important that again, we drop the bias. It is very important. Now, with any pain medication that we give, you should always, number one, if you're the recipient of that pain medication, you need to be able to ask questions and you need to have those questions answered. We should always start with a full assessment and it shouldn't be just, when did it start, rate your pain, all this other stuff. It should be a conversation so that people can understand that it might not be physical pain as much as it is the emotional pain. And if we take care of the emotional or the spiritual pain, we may, like in the case with that lady and her cat, we may be able to reduce that pain simply by taking care of this, the brain. So um, we need to manage different things that Socks that are too tight or shoes that are ill-fitting, but always try the non-pharmacological things first. That should always be the way it works. Now, it's a little different. In uh, my case as a nurse, I would go in and I would look at my patients um, 
disease process and see if maybe it is something that's going on with the disease process before I would actually start going to the non-farms first. But we need to remember that we need to be talking to all of our caregivers and help them to understand how important the assessment is, mind, body, and spirit. I'm not going to go into a lot of these different things, but I will say this, we have a lot of different kinds of pain. If you have um, diabetes, for example, you may have neuropathic pain. Um, I have neural pain because of a surgery and I have sustained some nerve damage. Um, somatic pain, if you've had a paper cut, you've had somatic pain. The visceral pain, really hard to figure out where that pain might be coming from, like the gallbladder, it might actually be a pain in the shoulder. How about the heart? can actually be pain in the jaw. So the visceral pain is very interesting. And then with breakthrough pain, um, somebody already has a disease process, but have we contributed to it by not adequately medicating this person and then moving them? So uh, phantom pain, you often hear about somebody that maybe had an amputation of some kind and they can still feel that limb. That, that is amazing how that brain can still react to that hand should be there. Crazy. But, and then we do chuckle about man pain. I'm sorry, I don't mean any disrespect, but it's actually kind of funny. But it's also scientific. Man pain is real. Um, our medications were actually created based on the pain that a male feels. And I, I will not go into a great amount of detail, but there's a lot of studies that prove that. One study was they offered males and females money for putting their hand in a bucket of ice water and maintaining that hand in that water for an extended period of time. The women couldn't do it but the men always were able to outlast the women because we process pain differently. And when they were looking at pain medications, they actually developed them for men because when they were doing testing, they couldn't test it on females because they might become pregnant. And so most of your pain medications, including morphine, is um, developed for the mu receptor, which is in the male, and the kappa receptor in the female. So there are some medications that won't even work on a male if they're designed for the kappa receptors. And then we see some of those medications when a woman is perhaps having a baby. Um, the medication that they give um, for that, she would be fine with it, but he's not gonna get any help from it. Also, females need more medication because the fact that it was developed for the mu receptor. And so men are, they're just different. And um, men, I would have to say this, women are a little bit more in tune with their body and able to say, hey, this hurts or I don't feel good or something where men don't be heroes. If you are having pain, if you are having any kind of thing going on, go to the doctor. Nobody's gonna think that you are weak. Now we have a lot of different types of medication, but there are three major classes. The non-opioids, that would be the Tylenol, acetaminophen, um, aspirin, that kind of thing. Then we have the opioids and there's a whole bunch of information that goes along with that, but that would be your morphine, oxycodone, Vicodin, codeine, all of these. And then we have the adjunctives, and these would be your antidepressants. So we're going to talk about those. But why is this important? Because pain travels differently in the body. Our delta fibers, if I stub my toe, that 40 means that that, that fiber is going to travel about 40 miles an hour to my brain. That, that um, thin fiber is covered by a substance, a fatty substance called myelin. And that's what helps that to travel so quickly. Your C fibers have no myelin at all. And this is why that travels at only three miles an hour. And 
you know, you think that that's pretty fast because you're not that huge and three miles an hour can get from your toe up to your brain very easily and very quickly. But it's just the slowness of that travel and it continues to travel slowly. And so this is where you're going to see this in chronic pain. Sensory fibers, however, are highly myelinated, lots of fat substance around that particular nerve. And so that travels at 275 miles an hour. That's why when we have something like a massage or acupuncture, it goes into those sensory fibers and it really, really, really helps. So if we know that there are different things, how did we get into this opioid crisis? Well, you can see the slide. When you look at this one night cough syrup, it had alcohol, cannabis, chloroform, and morphine in it. They gave that to people that were under five years old even. Uh, Dr. Betty had asthma cigarettes and it cured everything from asthma to bad breath. The big one was Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. Now, Mrs. Winslow's syrup was patented and supposedly compounded by Charlotte Winslow. Um, and it was first marketed by her son-in-law, Jeremiah. And this was in 1845, but there were things in there. There was morphine sulfate and 65 milligrams per fluid ounce of morphine in there, along with sodium carbonate and um, ammonia. But this was actually sold here in the United States for teething, for restlessness. Yeah, you're gonna knock your child out with 65 milligrams of morphine per ounce. That's uh, quite a little bit. And they did have some children that died as a result of using Mrs. Winslow syrup, but it was sold in the United States until 1930. And there's a lot of discussion about cannabis and the CBD. Is it legal? In most states now, yes. Does hemp oil do the same thing as CBD? It does not. Hemp oil was actually produced to do things of more, um, trying to think of the term for it, but it, it would be more industrial where, and it had very, very little CBD in it. They do a lot of research on CBD for pain. It does work, but does it work on all people? Um, we don't really know. We know that there's a, a lot of study that's being done on children with different types of seizure activity, and they're using CBD for that. But there are problems with it because there is no known safe dose for it. And this is why we aren't giving it to children all the time. And this is why, um, quite frankly, the FDA hasn't approved it for all uses at this point in time, because we do know that some people who use it will gonna have elevated liver enzymes. And if you already have a problem with your liver, fatty liver, et cetera, it can definitely cause some more problems. Is it addictive? Most likely not, because there isn't any uh, THC in it. THC is that, um, component that's going to give you like the psychedelic effect. You know, you're going to be thinking weird things. You're not going to do that with CBD, but it does actually help. Um, I myself do uh, CBD oil every morning and I can see that it, it doesn't jazz me up or anything, but it does seem like I have a little bit more energy sometimes. And that's after I've taken it for a while. Who knows if it's psychosomatic? I don't know. But this is just a graph here uh, to show what happened during um, the time when we had individuals that, remember there was a time when we cut back the opioid use. Um, they wouldn't give people who had been on pain management for a long time, they wouldn't give them those drugs anymore partly because doctors were concerned about lawsuits, um, but they had to be concerned about other things as well, because if somebody was on that medication for an extended period of time, and now they had to pull it back because the FDA said that they had to, 
now we had um, just two, I think maybe it was two years, maybe it was three, but there was a doctor in the state of Indiana that the husband came to the doctor and he said, my wife needs that medication that you've pulled from her. She, he, she needs more. And the doctor said, I've given her all I can. And he was shot and killed in the parking lot. So there's a lot of things that are going on with the opioid analgesics. And I, I don't know where this is going in the future, but I can tell you this, when we continue to use alcohol and street drugs to control pain, then um, we're gonna have more people that die and we're gonna have more people that are addicted. So judicious prescribing would be beautiful. Um, my girlfriend was given for a surgery on her leg. She fell and broke her leg and had some pins put in. And the doctor gave her Percocet every six hours for 15 days. Well, what happens is the opioid addiction can actually begin within three to five days. And it was way more opioid than what she needed. And so if she had continued on with that drug, we talked at length about it, um, but had she continued with that drug, she probably would have gotten uh, much worse and had a hard time getting away from it. But, you know, this is what's happening in our country. And there is a difference between addiction and pseudo addiction. When we have an addiction, we're going to use that no matter what. Now, I don't know how many of you got up this morning and had to have that cup of coffee. I did. And one of the reasons I did it is because I like the coffee, but I also don't like the headache. That is because my body has gotten so used to that caffeine that if I don't get it, now I'm going to have some problems. Now, am I gonna go out there and crawl across cut glass to get to a cup of coffee? No, but if you're addicted to a drug and your body is craving that, there are people that will do extreme things so that they can have that drug. Now, a pseudo addiction looks a lot like an addiction. These people will appear like they're they're craving this drug they will watch the clock they'll tell you exactly when that medication is due um they will actually show a lot of signs that look like addiction but it's because they are maybe under treated and they sometimes the pain medication that they're giving is no longer effective and that would go along with um what looks like an addiction. Now this here is a woman who was addicted. She claimed that she was having problems with her arthritis, that she was out of her medication and that the doctor was out of state and couldn't be, or she was going out of state and they uh, couldn't reach her doctor. Um, all of these things, it, me in a nursing situation, I would be looking at this very carefully. Um, and I will tell you this, my son was truly addicted. He was in the military, he hurt his shoulder. The medication that they gave him was too strong. It went to the pleasure center of the brain. So he didn't mind being over in this situation as badly. It had helped him to cope. And so he began uh, actually creating means to get more drugs. And by the time he came home, he was taking nine oxycodone a day. And um, we detoxed him here at home, but it was not fun. It was definitely not fun, but this is what you'll see. They will use this drug no matter what, and they'll make up all kinds of creative excuses about why they need it versus somebody with a pseudo addiction. So and I can tell you because my grandson had leukemia, <coughs> it is uncomfortable. And this kid was in the hospital. He was getting a small amount of morphine and it wasn't enough. And he kept pushing the button to get more. So he started actually showing signs or, or what could be construed as signs about needing more medication. He would cry and groan and, and he was grumpy and all of these things, anything to get more growth just to make himself comfortable. 
And once somebody is comfortable, those behaviors will stop. And that's the big difference. The behaviors don't stop in a true addiction case. The behaviors do stop with a pseudo addiction if they have the right treatment. And dependence and tolerance are two different things. A person who is dependent, like I said, um, on perhaps the um, coffee, the caffeine, they would go ahead and drink the coffee because they don't want to have the headache. But sometimes we have to make those choices in life that are very uncomfortable for us. If you feel like something like cigarettes is controlling your life and you don't want the smell or the expense or the feeling, then you have to want something more differently than that to get away from it. That's what dependence is. But tolerance, if you've been on medication for an extended period of time and that medication doesn't seem to be working as much, well, now we've got to do something a little bit different. Maybe we have to change the class of drug completely in order to help this individual uh, receive the pain management that they had before. And so that's the difference between tolerance and dependence. We use a lot of antidepressants now, and they are really wonderful. We have tricyclic antidepressants that you use the same dose to um, treat pain. And it is just amazing what it can do. So I'm sorry, I misspoke myself. Tricyclics, we're going to use a little bit less to treat pain than what we're going to use for depression. Um, but there are some side effects. Then we have serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. That's going to be Effexor and Cymbalta. And they have fewer side effects. But then there's the things like Paxil and Prozac. That is just for antidepressant. doesn't help at all with pain. But the, the pros and cons are this. It does work. The negatives are it takes time to get in the system, just like an antidepressant. So it's going to take time to get into that system. And if it isn't the proper medication for them, it's going to take time to wean them off. So it can be potentially weeks for finding the right um, drug for the pain management. Um, individuals might have a lot of problems with this and feel like nothing is going to work. And so we can have the risk of um, suicide. And that's never a good thing. But food and pain. When we look at what we eat here in the United States, it is not really good. In 2016, the Academy of Integrative Pain Management, they looked at dietary recommendations, but they didn't look at dietary recommendations concerning pain. And diet can influence pain through many, many mechanisms. It can influence inflammation. Um, it can shift the microbiome in the gut. And it can actually modulate the immune system. So eliminating triggers and, and reducing deficiencies, this is what we need to do. But about 70 to 80% of the individuals in the United States right now are vitamin D deficient. And this does make them report a lot more pain, particularly hypersensitivity and nerves. And if diet can increase pain, it makes sense that it can also decrease pain as well. We're looking here at the glycemic index that people have, the, the amount of sugar that we're eating. Um, processed foods, all of these things will actually harm your body and help stimulate the pain receptors. So what should we eat? We want to make sure that we have a low glycemic index diet. So high in polyphenols, these are foods that are fresh fruits and vegetables that are rich in color. Polyphenols give that color that's going on there. We need fiber. We need fiber for you know, keeping your gut running smoothly, fruits, vegetables, healthy fats. And when you're eating your fruits and vegetables, if you can eat them with the skin, that's actually really, really good for you. 
But there are so many things that are on that skin sometimes. I would encourage you to soak your fruits and vegetables in white vinegar and water, and then clean them very carefully, making sure that you're getting all the pesticides off. And we need to look at things that are going to help that that gut biome that's going to give us that diversity and so we're going to be a lot healthier and then alternatives to medications i, I am a natural girl i'm older i am not on any medications i choose to look at alternative therapies whenever possible now what does that mean for me well it means that maybe sometimes if i'm a little bit nauseated um, I'm going to drink some burners, some ginger ale. Ginger ale is very good for helping to soothe the stomach. I might look at aromatherapy if I have a headache, um, something that's going to help open my sinuses perhaps if it's a sinus headache. Massage, because that massage can help reduce that stress and strain that's in the muscles. Music, you know, we have the thing here for hypnotism but think about the beautiful effects of music when you are well when i'm cleaning house i want to listen to disco music not my choice of music the rest of the time but i really enjoy it because it lifts my spirits and it helps me to move um, but really truly music and activity all of these things that are going to help you if you know that something makes you feel better do it if you know something's going to make you feel worse avoid it there are some people that you may want to avoid if you're having pain or nausea um, you want to avoid these people because they don't really make you happy and so your body is going to respond to that so there are a lot of different therapies this is just a very very short list but again you are unique your pain is unique to you and the things that are going to be alternatives that are going to help you are also going to be unique to you so it's not a one thing fits all that's just not the way it works and then of course um we're looking at end of life and you know some of us are getting older and uh, may have already uh, experienced someone in our life that has died but when we are at the end of life, I know that for me, I've had a lot of people that said, oh, no, 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 I don't want them to have any medication. We have to help people understand that if this person had to have pain medication before, even if they're seeming to be in a semi-comatose state, they probably still need pain medication because we're still gonna move them. And so education is the key, gentle, education helping people understand what's going on and one of the things that i do is i actually talk to them about how to look at their loved one and tell whether or not there's pain so how do we do that <clears throat> excuse me we want to help them understand that they have to look at their loved one and if they're going to move their loved one are they guarding or groaning what are they doing as a nurse i look at the um, autonomic signs the increased heart rate breathing blood pressure because that's not something that they can make up this is a you know a physiologic sign and so i can use that to help them to understand if i can slow down that respiratory rate a little bit this person's going to breathe a lot more comfortably and if we were all together i'd i have a uh, a wonderful little example and maybe you could do it now and that is just take a breath every three seconds and try to do that for one minute that's 32 breaths a minute if we're taking eight breaths in 15 seconds and um, that is not how we normally breathe but when you breathe like that you're going to increase that um, adrenaline in your brain it's not going to feel good in your head and it's going to increase that heart rate it's going to bring up that blood pressure and this is what we see sometimes and how we have to do some of that teaching hand holding and heart holding this is essential so helping families to understand what's going on we also have to help people understand 
how we can use medications and adjunctives. So we can use medications maybe at a lower dose if we're also doing massage or music therapy or some other thing we're going to be able to talk to them about respiratory depression. We do want to slow the breathing down. We don't want to stop it. I mean, ethically, morally, that would be wrong. Um, but we also have to explain that there's going to be constipation with some of these medications and all of these things. I'm not going to belabor all this because this is not what we're here for. And this is really written more for um, a nursing uh, facility or uh, nursing care people, but we want to help you to understand that these are things that can go along with it. These are the fears that people have. Ask questions, and if somebody is worth their salt, they're going to explain things to you. So we use morphine at end of life, and a lot of people are very afraid of that. But think about this. You've had a long day. You come home, you take off your shoes and you sit down. How do you feel? When somebody is in a situation where they've had pain for an extended period of time and we give medication to get that pain reduced, it's like sitting in the easy chair. They're able to sleep, they're able to rest. But unfortunately, sometimes people do experience the double effect where they've had pain up to here for so long that their body is exhausted. And now we get that pain under control a little bit and they're far more relaxed. And some people actually do die because they are comfortable for the first time in a long time. But we have to explain that double effect. And a gentle way to do that is the easy chair. We're just putting this person in the easy chair. I have seen people that have died in very bad situations with their pain not controlled. And that is heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking as a care manager. It's heartbreaking as a nurse. But what's even more heartbreaking is realizing that that family was going to relive that moment time after time. And this is why teaching hand holding and heart holding is so important, not just about disease, but about the medications and how they react. It's called compassion. And we do have a lot on morphine because that is what is used very, very often toward end of life. But here's something actually kind of cool. Um, Bear was trying to find a way to get people off morphine, especially when they came back from World War I and World War II. And so they were trying to figure out how to get them off. So this is supposed to be an antidote heroin. And, you know, that was really not a good thing. Um, but now heroin is one of those drugs that we're seeing on the street in even higher amounts now. Um, heroin oftentimes mixed with um, fentanyl and people are dying as a result of getting this. So heroin with these little jars, this is actually from a state lab. Um, I'm trying to remember the state that, this was from but forgive me i can't recall right this moment but it was a state police lab and so the heroin that you see in that itty bitty jar that's not very much but the fentanyl is just those little grains in there that is enough to kill a human being and a lot of people ask well why can't we just put a fentanyl patch on people sometimes it's not the best medication for this individual the little bit of powder that you see on that dark material, if you scooped up all that powder and put it on Lincoln's nose, that is about three milligrams and that is enough to kill an adult. So this is why we have to really understand the different drugs and do that, again, teaching, hand-holding and heart-holding. You'll hear me say that over and over and over. But the knowledge, that we have to have. We have to have knowledge of the people, the person that we're taking care of, the medication that we're giving. We also have to improve our listening skills. And I say, don't listen with just the ears, listen with your eyes and listen with your heart. Because 
people can tell you all kinds of things with the tone of their voice and our listening skills are so important because we'll pick up on things that we see and hear as opposed to just the spoken word. Uh, the assessment is very important. It has to be proper for each individual. And if we are really being honest, sometimes we rush through things, but we rush through things and so we need to be patient. Pain is what they say it is. So we have to be a good listener. We have to be a good detective, know our biases, and make sure that we're always paying attention to these individuals with kindness and compassion. So I think that's it. Um, if you have- At, at the moment, uh, I haven't seen any questions come through. So, and any, if you didn't get a chance to enter your question, feel free to send it to webinar, W-E-B-I-N-A-R, at ncro.org and we'll make sure we get it to Andy and get you an answer back. Uh, because as my old boss used to say, the only bad question is the one that you don't ask. <laughs> so feel free to to, um, to make it, send it off and uh, we do listen. Um, but at this point, I'm not seeing any questions come through, and I'll make sure I haven't messed up and I don't have the, the screen shown. But Andy, thank you so much. And I guess uh, at this point, unless somebody on the committee has a question for Andy, uh, we will we'll call it a wrap and uh, let everyone get back to their uh, their normal day and you now have a, a good chance of having a nice lunch, I'd say. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this and be happy to speak with your group anytime. Well, very much. Thank you so much and everyone have a wonderful day and above all, stay safe. And with that, I'm going to close the webinar down. Thank you, Andy. Thank, thank you. you, Casey and, and Chuck and Stan. Excellent job. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're welcome.